All right, if you've got your uh, Bibles handy or your outlines, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 17 to 20. So only a few verses, but that's going to launch us into the rest of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to do a bit, little bit of an overview uh, this morning. So Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth, earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, on Monday night, uh, church council met for our monthly prayer meeting and uh, our pastoral care meeting. Uh, I chose 1 Timothy 3 as our Bible reading, which is the passage that lists the qualifications for elders and deacons. It includes stuff like, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, etc., etc. And I ask the question, what is our hope when we fall short of those standards? To which an elder who will remain nameless jokingly replied that no one will find out. And we all laughed. But how true is that? Our hope is that people will, won't find out the things that we struggle with, the ways that we fall short, or the areas in our lives where we've failed, the times we've lost control, when we haven't been gentle, or we haven't managed our household well, and they're the more respectable ones. This morning, Jesus speaks to that issue. This morning, we're going to look at Jesus' words about righteousness, about what it means to live a life that is right in God's eyes. These are some of the most confronting and challenging words in the whole Bible. And we're going to start by looking at the relationship between righteousness and the law uh, before we look at what Jesus means by a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. So let's start with the relationship between righteousness and the law. Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. When Jesus talks about the law and the prophets, he's referring to the Old Testament as a whole. They're sort of like the bookends of the Old Testament. Jesus came not to abolish the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. What does Jesus mean that he came not to abolish the Old Testament? Because some people think Jesus did come to abolish the Old Testament. They read verses like Romans 6.14, where Paul says, you are not under law, but under grace. And you have died to the law through the body of Christ. And now we are released from the law. And Christ is the end of the law. And people point to passages like Romans 13 verse 8. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Is Paul at odds with Jesus? Has the law been abolished? Has the law ended with Jesus? Well, before we unpack what Jesus says, I want to start with a point the Bible makes crystal clear. The law can't make you right with God. Paul says, by works of the law, no human being will be justified or made right in God's eyes. And in Galatians 2, he makes the same point twice in one verse. He says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 
In fact, he puts it even more strongly a few verses later. He says, if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul is crystal clear. The law can't make you right with God. Now, while Jesus isn't quite that direct, he teaches the same thing. Earlier in the service, we looked at Jesus' parable about those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And the guy who was righteous wasn't the guy who tried to keep the law, but the guy who stood far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the guy who was made right with God. And in Mark, Jesus declares, no one is good except God alone. No one is righteous, Jesus says. No one is good except God. In fact, Jesus exposes the sin in the guy who thought he perfectly obeyed God's law. He said to the guy, go and sell everything you had, and the man couldn't. He went away sad. In John's Gospel, Jesus says to the crowd, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Like Paul, Jesus knew that as sinful human beings, we are unable to keep the law. That instead of making us right with God, the law condemns us. The law points out where we fall short and the reasons why God ought to be angry with us. So if the law is unable to make us right with God, why doesn't Jesus abolish it and throw it away? Well, according to Jesus, he instead came to fulfill it. So how does Jesus fulfill the law? Well, traditionally, he fulfills it in three ways. Firstly, he is the fullness of God's revelation. The Old Testament is God's revelation of who he is. And Jesus is God's ultimate revelation. The letter of Hebrews starts, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is God's ultimate revelation to humanity because Jesus is God in the flesh, God in all of his glory, God in all of his perfection. The Apostle John starts his gospel. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And he's talking about Jesus. Jesus has made God known. In fact, Jesus himself says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the fullness of God's revelation. You will never know more about God in this life than what Jesus has revealed in his person, ministry and life. Secondly, Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecy. The Old Testament reveals God's plan to save humanity through the Messiah. And it does that in two ways. Firstly, through direct predictions. The Old Testament tells what this Messiah will be like and what he will do. And the New Testament highlights how Jesus fulfills those predictions. For example, Matthew writes about Jesus' conception. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And he quotes Isaiah 7.14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And he says, Jesus fulfills that prediction, that prophecy in the Old Testament. Matthew actually mentions 12 specific prophecies that Jesus fulfills. Scholars suggest that Jesus fulfills about 50 Old Testament direct prophecies and about 300 allusions, uh, words that are fulfilled in Christ's life, even though it's not obvious in the Old Testament they're about Jesus. So, so Jesus fulfills those Old Testament predictions. But secondly, Jesus foreshadows Old Testament symbols. 
What that means is that certain institutions in the Old Testament point towards Jesus and are fulfilled in Jesus. For example, the sacrificial system. The letter of Hebrews says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. If that's the case, why on earth did God tell his people to sacrifice bulls and goats if their blood didn't take away sins? Well, the answer is found in verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So the sacrificial laws, the killing of goats and sheep and bulls and all the rest, that they're actually shadows of Jesus Christ. The reality is Jesus and those things pointed to him. The blood of bulls and goats were shadows of Jesus' blood shed on the cross. While they couldn't take away sins, they pointed to what could, the blood of Jesus. In the same way, the Old Testament kings and the priests and the prophets all shadowed Jesus, the real king, the ultimate priest and the true prophet. Even things like water coming out of the rock during the Exodus and the, the manna falling from heaven and the bronze serpent, serpent being lifted up on a stake, they're, they're all pointing to Jesus. They were like parables that God was using to tell people about what God would one day do for them in Jesus Christ. At the end of Luke's gospel, Jesus says, Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus himself saw all the Old Testament as being about himself. He fulfills it. And that's why we don't practice so much of the Old Testament ceremonies, because they're being fulfilled in Jesus. Thirdly, Jesus perfectly fulfills God's law. The Old Testament is full of laws, laws that define what is right in God's eyes, laws that we constantly break, laws that condemn us as being unrighteous. But unlike us, Jesus perfectly obeys God's law. While we are unrighteous, Jesus is righteous. Jesus says, I always do the things that are pleasing to my father, and I do as the father has commanded me. In fact, Jesus' greatest act of obedience is laying down his life on the cross for you and for me. Paul writes, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it's by Jesus' obedience that you and I are made righteous. Again, Paul says, by Christ's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The good news is that not only does Jesus fulfill the Old Testament law, he fulfills it for you and me. We are no longer made right with God by obeying the law, but by putting our faith in the one who perfectly obeyed God's law. Paul writes, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. We are made righteous, not through the law, but through our faith in Jesus. But if that's true, why does Jesus say the law remains in effect? Verse 18, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The law remains until Jesus returns, until God's kingdom comes in all of its fullness. Why? Why does it remain? The answer is because the law reveals what is right. The law reveals God's will. The law defines what is good. The law reflects God's character. The reason why we don't throw away the command, do not lie, is because God doesn't lie. And to speak the truth is godly and right. When we speak the truth, when we don't lie, we are behaving like God. 
The reason why children should honour their parents is because, as Paul says in Galatians 6 verse 1, this is right. It is the right thing to do. The reason why we don't commit adultery is because marriage reflects our relationship with God and faithfulness is good and right. So when Paul says love is the fulfilment of the law, he's not saying that love replaces the law, but that the law defines what love looks like. The law remains because the law is good. And because of that, doing and teaching the law is right. Jesus says in verse 19, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we don't do or teach the law to make us right with God. Rather, we do and teach the law because it's how we please God. It's how we show our gratitude for God's righteousness, which he gives us through faith in Jesus. Rather than chucking out the law, Jesus calls us to obey the law and to encourage others to obey it. The law can't make us righteous, uh, righteous with God, but it teaches us what righteousness is. Like the Ten Commandments showed God's Old Testament people what it meant to live God's way, so it teaches us how we can honour God in our daily lives. The law is good and doing it is right. So in the rest of this sermon, I want to look at Jesus' comment in verse 20. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What does Jesus mean by a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees? Of course, he means that the only way we can get into heaven is by putting our faith in him and receiving his righteousness. That's the only righteousness by which we can enter heaven. But he also talks about a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. So that's part of the answer. That's what we looked at in the first point. But I want to look at Five other ways that this righteousness Jesus talks about exceeds that of the Pharisees. John Stott says in his commentary that Jesus is talking about a different kind of righteousness rather than a different degree of righteousness. So he's not saying we need to be more righteous, but we need to have a different righteousness. Righteousness. So we're going to look at how this righteousness is different than that of the Pharisees. Firstly, Jesus says it's a righteousness of the heart. Jesus' problem with the righteousness of the Pharisees is that it's merely external. They observed the letter of the law, but it didn't penetrate into their inner lives. Jesus says about them, you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And Jesus gives two examples of this in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, actually he gives quite a few, but I'm just going to look at two. The first is anger. Uh, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder Uh, And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. The Pharisees were only concerned with the outward behaviour. But Jesus, and by extension God, is concerned with the inner attitude. The problem isn't, haven't you murdered anyone, but have you ever wanted to? Have you gotten angry with someone? And Jesus says that's the heart attitude that leads to murder. That's the thing that God's concerned about, what's going on inside. The second example he gives is lust. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, the Pharisees were only concerned with the outward behaviour. As long as they hadn't committed the act of adultery, they were okay. But God cares about what's in our hearts, about the lust that motivates adultery. 
As far as Jesus is concerned, in giving the Ten Commandments, God wasn't just confronting external behaviour, but internal attitudes as well. The righteousness that Jesus calls us to isn't the external righteousness of the Pharisees, but a righteousness of the heart that honours God. You can rock up to church and stand proud that you haven't broken any of the Ten Commandments, but that's the righteousness of the Pharisees. It's not the righteousness of God that looks into our very hearts and what's going on inside of us. God cares about what's going on inside your heart this morning. Secondly, Jesus' righteousness is a proactive righteousness. Jesus says in chapter 5, 23 and 24, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. The righteousness of the Pharisees was only concerned with themselves, not others. If someone had a problem with them, it was their problem. But Jesus says that to be truly righteous, you need to care about other people. Other people matter. You can't worship God when your relationships with others are broken. And notice that it's the other guy who has the problem, and yet Jesus calls us to fix it. That's why I say it's proactive. We are to take the initiative to make things right. That's what proactive righteousness is. And in a sense, that's exactly what Jesus did. It wasn't Jesus who stuffed up our relationship with him, it was us. And yet Jesus leaves heaven, comes down to earth, and then goes on, dies on a cross to reconcile our broken relationship with him. That's proactive. That's what Jesus calls us to do to lay down our rights to make things right with other people. Jesus makes no room for a victim mentality. He says, if someone has wronged you, if someone has hurt you, if someone has done something unjust against you, you work towards making that right. Just like Jesus worked towards making things right between us and himself. Did I mention that it was pretty challenging stuff? That's a righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees. Next, Jesus calls us to a godly righteousness. Towards the end of chapter 5, Jesus contrasts the righteousness he's talking about, not with the Pharisees, but with Gentiles and sinners, just with general people in the world. He, he, he contrasts the love that God has with the love the world has. Uh, look at verse 46 and 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Loving people who love you is right and very normal in this world. But it falls far short of the sort of love that God showed us in Jesus the sort of love that God calls us to show in our lives. Look at verse 43 to 45. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on un the unjust. What Jesus is saying is that true righteousness isn't just about obeying the rules, but about reflecting our Heavenly Father. The thing that defines righteousness is God. We may think it's right to hate our enemies, but that's worldly righteousness, not God's righteousness. God's righteousness is what God does. God sees a bunch of people that hate him, that won't, don't want to have anything to do with him, that prefer that he would leave them alone, People who practice evil and injustice. And what does God do? He pours out sunshine on them and provides them with rain. And Paul adds, God satisfies their hearts with food and gladness. God is good to evil people. 
God loves his enemies every single day that they're alive on this planet. The righteous Jesus is talking about doesn't do what everyone else does, but what God does. A godly righteousness doesn't hate our enemies or get back at them or treat them with indifference. It prays for them. It looks for opportunities to show God's love to them. In fact, verse 48 pretty much sums up these three first types of righteousness. Jesus says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus is calling us not to aim for what the world thinks is right or even for what the Pharisees think is right, but for what God thinks is right. A righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees is God's righteousness. Fourthly, Jesus talks about a personal righteousness. In Matthew 6, Jesus rejects the righteousness of the Pharisees for being public rather than personal. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And then he mentions three practices that the Pharisees thought made them righteous. Uh, giving to the needy, prayer and fasting. And now Jesus isn't condemning those things. Rather, he's condemning the attitude that it's being seen to do those things that make you righteous rather than your personal relationship with God. He says, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Now, Jesus isn't saying that only doing what's right in private rather than public is what matters. It's not a private versus public thing. After all, a few verses earlier, he said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. God, Jesus wants people to see our good works. He's not saying don't do those things publicly. Rather, he's saying don't do these things so people will think, look how righteous he is. The righteousness of the Pharisees was about how other people saw them. The righteousness that Jesus calls us to is about how God sees us. The issue isn't between public or private, but public or personal. Jesus wants to know, are you only righteous when someone is watching you? When someone can say, what a good Christian that guy is. What a wonderful Christian woman that person is. Or are you desiring to be righteous all the time, even when other people don't see? Who are you living for? For God or for the praise of others? Finally, Jesus says this righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees isn't just of the heart. It's not just only proactive and godly and personal. It's also practical. Jesus ends his sermon with two clear warnings for those who call themselves Christians, for you and for me. Firstly, he says, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do. Chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This is, these people are to all intents confessing Christians. By calling Jesus Lord, they are recognizing that Jesus is God, that he's divine. By calling Jesus Lord, Lord, it expresses their, a certain amount of enthusiasm for Jesus. They're not shy of being Christians. They, they, they're very vocal about it. Uh, and it's also a very public confession of faith. The next verse talks about them prophesying in your name and casting out demons in your name and doing many mighty works in your name. These people were very public in their ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. They looked like Christians. They confessed his name. They did ministry in his name. But Jesus says, I never knew you. The problem wasn't their confession, but their lifestyle. The problem was not with what they said, but what they didn't do. 
They didn't do the Father's will. The righteousness that Jesus is looking for goes deeper than calling him Lord. And and secondly, Jesus says, it's not about what you know, it's about what you do. Let me compare verse 24 and 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. Jesus is saying, it's not enough to hear my words. It's not enough to know what I've said. It's not enough to know correct theology and doctrine. You have to do it. You have to live it out in your daily life. The righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees isn't just to confess Jesus as Lord. It's not just to know what Jesus taught. It's obedience. It's to do what he says. It's very practical. Brothers and sisters, your righteousness will never be enough. Only Jesus can make you right with God. Only Jesus' righteousness can fulfill God's righteous uh, requirements. But Jesus doesn't abolish the law because the law defines what, what righteousness is. In fact, Jesus calls us to a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. He calls us to pursue not an external righteousness, so that we look good on the outside, but an internal one that goes right to the depth of our heart. He calls us to a righteousness that is proactive, that seeks to do what is right no matter the personal cost. He calls us to a godly righteousness, to do what is right, not in the eyes of the world, not in the eyes of the church, but in the eyes of God. Jesus calls us to a personal righteousness. It's not about what other people think about us, but what God thinks. And he calls us to a practical righteousness, to not just look righteous, but to do what is right. Jesus is calling you to trust in his righteousness and to be righteous people. These are some of the most confronting and challenging words in the Bible. If you call yourself a Christian, you are making a commitment to live a righteous life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we read these words of Jesus. And Lord, they're overwhelming. Lord, he presents a righteousness there that is so far above what the Pharisees thought made them right with God that we know it's just unattainable. Lord, we can't do this stuff. Lord, we fall short. Lord, we fail all the time. And yet, Lord, our hope is in Jesus who perfectly obeyed your law. Our hope is in the righteous one who fulfills all righteousness. Lord, our hope is that when we put our faith in Jesus, his righteousness is given to us. And it's only his righteousness that can make us right with you. But Lord, that doesn't mean we can just live however we want. Doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. Lord, it means that we seek to be like you. Lord, we desire to do what is right in your eyes. Lord, we desire righteousness that's not just external, that what other people can see, but that works right down to the core of our heart. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit that's working in our hearts, that's changing us. Lord, you call for a righteousness that's proactive that sees brokenness and sees unrighteousness and reaches out to make things right again. Like Jesus reached out to make things right between us and you. Lord, you call us to a godly righteousness. Lord, we don't judge righteousness according to the world's values, but according to you and your values. Lord, we pray that it would be a personal relationship with you, not just being right so other people can see it, but that we would seek to honour you in every aspect of our lives, even in the closed doors. And Lord, we pray that we would truly do what is right. 
not just say it, not just know it, but live it out in our daily lives. That people might see and glorify you, not glorify us. Because, Lord, we know it's only possible because of what Jesus has done and what you are doing in us through your spirit. Lord, help us to be righteous people. In Jesus' name, amen.